heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the latest updates from the earthquake in Taiwan. That's as the island faces its worst seismic event in 25 years. Full coverage ahead. And then look at the broader implications of this human tragedy for the global economy. Plus, Disney's months-long proxy battle nears its end as shareholders place their final votes in the battle between the Mouse House and Trian. We'll sit down with one shareholder, Ross Gerber. And Spotify, it announces its rising prices again in several markets for the second time in a year. It's a crucial step towards reaching long-term profitability. We'll discuss that and so much more throughout the hour. But first to check on in these public markets and look a reprieve. We've got a strong set of data when it comes to ADP numbers, when it comes to the labor force in the US, but maybe just a pullback in the services area. That breathes life into the equity market after the biggest sell-off in a month yesterday. We're up five tenths percent on the Nasdaq. Look at a 10-year yield that just continues to crescendo higher at the moment and this is borrowing costs really move with the idea that the market thinks maybe we won't get those three rate cuts that the Federal Reserve has signaled for this year I'm looking though also at what happened in Taiwan trading notably down by some six tenths percent not an enormous move after what was a serious human tragedy and one that has implications on technology that we'll dive into in a moment look at what's happening in the world of crypto just briefly because this asset of choice at the moment currently actually up 1.4 percent just spiking a little bit in the last couple of hours of trading we're still only at the 66 $6,000 level. There's market moves, the fact that the ETF flows perhaps have slowed somewhat, and what that means for volatile trading over in Asia, interestingly, particularly when it comes to some of the algorithms that end up selling Bitcoin on the back when we get the inflow and outflow data from ETFs. But Ed, you're going to focus more on Asia right now. Yeah, these are the US listed uh, shares of the technology companies impacted in Taiwan. TSMC, the world's biggest contract manufacturer for chips, front and center. The ADRs have risen because of a positive operational update. We'll bring you the details in just a moment. Micron has a big presence as well. It said that it's evaluating the situation on the ground in Taiwan, but all of its staff were safe. Caroline, bring our audience the absolute latest details of what happened in Taiwan. Yeah, because it occurred last night, a 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck Taiwan. And it was, as we've said, the biggest seismic event by magnitude to hit the island since 1999. Now, so far, the death toll has reached nine. It's injured close to a thousand people and it's leveled dozens of buildings on the eastern side of the island as some of these pictures show. Shocks in fact were felt as far away as Japan and as China. But any damage from the quake is being closely watched for potential effects look on the global economy as well. Given its technology output, this island is dominant in the chip manufacturing industry. And it also accounts for more than half of global market for laptops and motherboards and network devices. And we've got to go into the implications for companies right now too. Yeah, honing in on the companies that operate in Taiwan. The island's tech firms are still assessing impact from the earthquake. TSMC, the world's number one chip contract manufacturer, had halted some chip making equipment and plants and evacuated them but these are the latest headlines from TSMC the company saying in the last half an hour they don't see damage to critical tools including all their EUV gear and they're expecting to resume production of semiconductors overnight let's bring in Bloomberg's Ian King who leads semiconductor coverage at Bloomberg technology Ian uh, what is the latest please for TSMC yeah I mean what they've done is come out and really reassure people that yes this isn't great yes there's been an impact but it's still within the bounds of what we can fix and fix quickly given our contingency plans so there will be some wafers lost there will be a bit of manufacturing loss but not the kind of months of disruptions that we've seen in the distant past and with other supply chain uh, disruptions that we saw during the pandemic. Just give us the context a little bit of just how integral Taiwan, TSMC, players like Foxconn as well when it comes to phones and laptops are to the global economy. Ian. Yeah, I mean, everything goes through TSMC. If it's a, a, the processor in your iPhone designed by Apple, it's made by TSMC. If it's the 
supercomputer in a, in a data center based on a chip from NVIDIA that's going through TSMC, if it's a, a modem that's allowing your phone to connect to a, a network, that's Qualcomm, that's going through TSMC. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Everybody depends on them. Okay, let's talk about what else is, is operational on the ground in Taiwan. I was interested to read about Micron's footprint, for example, Ian. Uh, there's a lot that happens there. We're talking about semiconductor manufacturing, but it's also at the circuit board level, the context of laptops and PCs. What other names are impacted and which areas of the technology economy should we look out for? Yeah, I mean, historically, Taiwan was an absolute center of effectively assembly of electronic devices. A lot of that has moved to mainland China, so it's not as crucial as it used to be in that area, but there are still a lot of technology companies that work for the sort of better, well-known names like Dell, like HP, that also operate in Taiwan. And as you mentioned, Micron, that's memory chips. Memory chips are really important as well for your PC, for your smartphone. And there is notable reaction across competitors right now. When you're looking at the rest of the chip stocks, I'm looking at the, well, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, most are in the green, Micron leading it, Broadcom, LAM Research. But actually, there's an interesting exception. And you would have thought Intel, a rival, would have done well out of the back of any supply chain headaches for rivals, but not so today. Yeah, this is an unfortunate kind of consequence is that any bad news for TSMC should be good news for what Intel is trying to do, which is effectively become a competitor for TSMC. It should have people saying, hey, we need to diversify geographically. Who can we do that with? Well, here's Intel. But because of some of the financial disclosures that Intel put out there last night, that unfortunately, at least in terms of Intel stock price, is not the case. Uh, Ian, the story with Intel is that it has different businesses, right? And we're talking in this instance about the foundry business. Intel wants to do what TSMC already does, be a contract manufacturer for third parties. And when I was looking through the, the financial disclosures they made, it's not just that they're booking less revenue on foundry. It's not just that the, the losses are widening, but their projections to the end of the decade make you a little bit concerned that they actually will get back to the era where Intel had north of 60% margins and they were the technology leader. That's the story that Pat Gelsinger, the CEO, has been trying to tell all three of us for quite a long time. Just explain, I guess, the shift in timeline that Intel disclosed last night. Yeah, I mean, I, th there wasn't a shock for those who've been studying it closely, but it was arguably a reminder that, look, this is an extremely expensive turnaround. You could argue that Gelsinger was, was intellectually honest and upfront about things, and people really should have been paying attention, but some of them weren't. If you're a casual investor, if you, you've got other options, why wouldn't you be investing in NVIDIA, Qualcomm, TSMC, all of these other companies? And what Intel did was really remind people that, yes, they're on a tough road, and they still have a ways to go. Uh, Ian, the stock is down 6.8% Intel. They have a new CFO. Who is it? Oh, it's a new CFO for the Foundry. Foundry division. Yeah, the main CFO is still there. Got it. Ian King, we thank you really taking us around the world of the chip industry today. We appreciate it enormously. Meanwhile, coming up, well, we're going back to Disney's months-long proxy battle with trans Nelson Peltz. Well, it's finally coming to an end. Today is the day that we get the shareholder meeting. We're going to be discussing it next with one key shareholder, Gerber Kawasaki CEO, Ross Gerber. This is Bloomberg Technology. Today is the day. Disney's shareholder meeting will determine the future of the entertainment company's boardroom. And a winner will emerge from a lengthy proxy battle between the company and the activist invest investor that is Nelson Peltz. Bloomberg sources say that look, Disney is close to clinching a win over Peltz and try and with Vanguard's backing that of Disney. Let's talk to Gerber Kawasaki CEO, Ross Gerber, who you've thrown your support behind Disney, behind Bob Iger, and it looks as though, well, most of the investor base retail and some of their big shareholders are doing the same. Well, yeah, I mean, Iger's a phenomenal executive. This is, Nelson Peltz is absurd. He's wasted so much time and money. You know, he, he's made a ton of money now on this activist campaign irrelevant of 
really he's going to accomplish nothing. I think Disney's going to win this, you know, pretty solidly with the backing of the institutional shareholders, um, you know, as well as many retail shareholders like we are. So the bottom line in this is how is Nelson Peltz going to do anything better for Disney other than cut costs? And, and that's already happened. Uh, Mr. Gerber, whether Mr. Peltz is absurd or not, he set out in a 133-page manifesto a lot of grievances right. focusing on the streaming business. And so let's say whatever happens, right, say uh, Iger is successful, the, the question that, that Mr. Peltz raised was how do you get that streaming business to profitability without d depending on a strategy that is raising prices for consumers while cutting the costs of content production? Do you have firm in your mind an answer to that question? Shogun. That is the answer. When you have shows and you have content that people want to see, they will pay for subscriptions. It's it's just what's happening in streaming. We're seeing it with sports subscriptions now, too, where people are signing up to watch a game on Paramount Plus, and then they're sticking 60 to 70% of the time after the game's over. So the shows, the hit shows, the talent, the IP that bring viewers in is what makes these streamers profitable, like Netflix. Every week, Netflix has something good on, every week. So finally, Hulu and Disney Plus are, are stepping up their game. They've combined the apps. They've built it onto one platform now. There's a tech side of this. This is a big thing that Disney's done to cut costs and make their library even more accessible to many different you know, platforms. But the bottom line is the shows drive Disney's success, and they have hit shows right now on their platforms, and that's the Iger magic that Pelts can never do. Gerber Kawasaki, your firm, according to the data on my Bloomberg terminal, 131,000 Disney shares or so. What is your firm's position on Iger succession? Well, you know, being a Disney shareholder my whole life and going through the, you know, past with, you know, Eisner and, and all the trials and tribulations, Iger is a young CEO based off the average age of a presidential candidate. So I'm not sure what will happen next. I think there's some competent executives that he can, you know, pick to take over that are hopefully more digitally focused. Um, and he's got some of the same team members around him from, you know, building Disney Plus in the past. So I'm not sure where he goes with this. Um, we'd like to see an internal succession as Disney typically does that. Um, but it's going to be really hard to find a replacement for Iger as it's always been a big challenge for Disney over its long history. Just really quick, Carrie, the argument that Ross has made before is that if Joe Biden can run for re-election as president, then Bob Iger can do another 10 years at Disney. Oh, yeah, yeah, easily. I just, Ross, I just wanted to... To, to make it simple for the audience, Cara, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, Iger's in great shape. I mean, he's he's mentally and physically fit, and, and you know, he's riding his bike on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m., like 20 miles. So, but you know, he's I'm shown in the past, Ross, that he wanted to exit, and then he had to come back. And I think, ultimately, the new board has really been focused on trying to understand where the path of the future is, who are in the internal candidates, who are the external candidates. And it's got to be, yes, someone who's digitally focused, but... Disney is a behemoth. It isn't just an exposure to digital. It's an exposure to parks, to experiences, to cruises. Right. And it's, it's an experience to, to big hit shows that go on to your movie theatres. How can we find someone who can be basically the consolidated leader of a business like this? Well, you just brought up probably one of the more challenging issues, right? Like running parks and resorts is nothing like running a streamer. And so somebody having these sort of skills to do it all is, is really a big ask. And that, hence why I heard and, and they got James Gorman on the board to try to help succession planning. But it's it's a challenge to find somebody with that type of operational expertise like period. So what I think is Disney's really big. And when you look at the ESPN piece that they're sort of carving into its own sort of business and then parks and resorts and experience and then, you know, the rest of the business, the streaming and the studios, I think they really need three strong leaders that are sort of have a CEO that's great at running those three leaders mm -hmm. because each leader is going to have to be different. And this is the problem that a lot of massive companies, whether it be Apple, Microsoft, whatever, are facing is they become so big and so profitable. Can one person really run all of this? You know, so I, I think we're, you know, this is a challenge for a lot of big companies, including Disney, is where do we go from here with succession planning? Because finding another Iger is obviously not going to happen. One reason 
Iger might want to hand over the baton sooner rather than later is because he's fed up with mudslinging coming from people like Elon Musk. And yeah. it's interesting that Elon Musk has decided to pile on at the last minute saying he would support, well, Peltz joining the board. We know he's got an axe to grind against Bob Iger. What did you make of that coming? <laughs> Well, hopefully Elon can keep his job as CEO of Tesla at this point, let alone making recommendations for activists. Because what's going to happen is Peltz is going to buy Tesla next and be calling the board of Tesla because an opportunity is arising for an activist in Tesla right now that looks amazing. So the best thing Elon can do is get his butt back to Tesla and start working on getting these cars out. You know, he's got to get Cybertruck out. He's got to get full self-driving working. He's got to you know, deal with competition. And instead, he's tweeting every day a bunch of garbage. So, you know, look at the performance of Disney versus, I, I think somebody tweeted this, you know, what's the performance between Disney versus Tesla over the last six months? And fortunately, Disney's the top holding at my fund, GK. And, you know, our clients, yeah. we have very close relationships with our clients, and they love these companies. But sometimes things change, and we've had to deal with the changes at Tesla for the negative and and for the positive, we are seeing positive changes for Disney and it's become a very good returning investment for our clients. Just give us the context on Elon Musk running Tesla, the environment with which he's running it at the moment, the response on X of basically calling out certain individuals' posts, calling them idiots because the EV landscape itself is contracting. BYD sales dropped 42%. He's referring to the competition coming from China. In fact, yes, we saw a pullback in terms of dis deliveries from Tesla yesterday, but actually it reclaimed its spot as the number one provider of EVs globally. Can you respond to the criticism that Elon Musk has? Of you. Well, yeah, you know, of you your are, tweet and calling you basically an idiot. idiot yeah. yeah, you know, I, I've been called that many times by Elon, but somehow, you know, I've survived this law. And we went to the same college. But that said, um, I think that if you look at global sales of EVs, it's up 35% year over year. Um, Tesla's losing share. BYD EV sales were actually up year over year. It was total sales. So it's easy to cherry pick numbers. But the EV market is growing. Only 9% of US consumers are buying EVs. So really, the truth of the matter is we can all call names and we can all look around and you know make excuses. The economy is very strong here in the United States. The economy in Europe is OK. China is definitely an issue. And it affects Tesla. But when you look at the gap between production and sales, that's not an economic issue. That's a sales issue. So once again, the guy throwing out names and all this kind of stuff because he doesn't like what people are saying about him, Mr. Free Speech, you know, but the fact of the matter is his free speech has cost Tesla shareholders $600 billion in losses and Tesla car owners have lost $50 billion of equity in their vehicles. And he's even forced the Hertz CEO to lose his job because it was such a bad investment buying Teslas for Hertz. So let's be real, Elon, like it's time for you to grow up and accept reality that you're causing enormous damage to one of the most consequential companies in the world because of your behavior on Twitter. And nobody wants to hear his opinions. Right. Anymore. Uh, you know, that's a fact. Uh, Ross, I'm just sorry, Carol. I've invited Elon onto this program many times. And in this case, I'll write to him again and say, you know, Ross responded to your post on X, he can come on the show. He obviously has declined or to do that. Uh, but Throw in the U-Pen thing. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah, both. listen, he's not going to debate me. He doesn't want to debate me because the fact of the matter is I'm not scared of him. And he's so used to bullying everybody out of the business. He's not going to bully me. So, you know, the reality is he's got to get his focus back on what's important, which is solving climate. It's not free speech. So, okay. you know, I'm sorry. Don't apologize, Ross Gerber. It's great to have you on. Gerber Kawasaki, yeah, CEO. Surviving another day of uh, some mudslinging on Twitter or X, but also talking us through Disney as well. We thank him for it. This is Bloomberg Technology.
it's time for Talking Tech. This is one I broke last night with the Bloomberg Deals team. Chipmaker Cerebras Systems has picked Citigroup as the lead bank on its initial public offering. Sourcing is telling us that the Silicon Valley company chose the lender after holding discussions with potential advisors on a US listing. Cerebras is targeting that listing in the second half of the year and may seek a valuation above the $4 billion figure it achieved in its last 2021 funding round. And during the phone call between President Biden and China Xi. The two are said to have discussed TikTok. White House spokesman John Kirby told reporters that Biden reiterated to Xi his concerns about Chinese ownership of the popular video sharing app. He said it was not about a ban of the application, but rather US interest in divestiture. Carrie. Meanwhile, let's talk about a previous President Donald Trump, who is suing two co-founders, Trump Media and Technology, claiming that they set the company up improperly and shouldn't get any stock in it. This comes amid wild swings in shares of the recently public company, of course, went through a SPAC. Let's talk about it all, the legal battle that is with Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz. And so just talk us uh, through us about the issues the co-founders have of Truth Social with Trump. Well, there was an initial lawsuit from the two co-founders saying that they were going to be diluted out of their 8.6 percent stake in Trump Media and Technology Group. And this is a counter lawsuit from Donald Trump saying that they deserve nothing. And this is really a deal that has had a number of lawsuits from the two co-founders to the founder of the actual SPAC that brought Trump Media public, who was suing about his stake. So there are a number of lawsuits. It's really mind-boggling to try to put into perspective just who is arguing what at this point. But as far as we know at this point, UAV, which is the investment group behind those two co-founders, they currently have, according to filings, a north of 5% stake. And Donald Trump has a roughly 57, 58% stake in Trump Media. Bailey, a stake in what exactly? I think this week we learned the reality of what the company is, does, its finances and its scale. And actually, there's not a lot there. Not a lot there. Really, the flagship product is Truth Social. The company declines to provide typical metrics, average users, monthly average users, any real data point behind that. But they did, in their 2023 filing, uh, update that they lost more than $50 million and generated a measly $4 million in revenue. So it really has seen, uh, we've really been tracking the technology company that trades under DJT, it really is more of a meme stock, a investment that people are buying because it has the potential to be sold to someone else at a higher valuation as opposed to the actual underlying business as it is fit right now. Uh, Bloomberg's Bay Lipschultz is being kept busy by the latest D-SPAC and what a story it is. Thank you. Now coming up on Bloomberg Technology, Spotify raising prices for the second time in a year. This is one actually that there was pretty immediate reaction to on different social media platforms because investors like it. The shares are up. But if you're a consumer and you have another subscription where the cost is going up, maybe you think again. I don't know. We're going to get all those details next. From New York City, side by side, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline. Hi. Let's get a quick check on these market sets. Because right now, we're actually seeing a bit of a reprieve after yesterday's sell-off. Now, notably, we've got a bounce back of six tenths of a percent on the Nasdaq 100. Remember, yesterday, the benchmarks basically fell the most in a month, as we're worried about, guess what, macro policy, Federal Reserve policy, whether or not we will indeed see three rate cuts happening over the course of the rest of this year. The market has started to doubt that because of some really robust data. Think of ADP that comes in today. But nevertheless, we managed to shake off those losses. Not so in the bond market. We're still up by some three basis points on the 10-year. Bitcoin, though, like alongside some of the other tech risk assets, we're up nine-tenths of a percent. Still at 66,000, though, well off those previous highs. Move on, have a look at some of the individual movers that we got on the nose today. Look, there is a human cost disaster that we're talking about that's happened in, Di- in Taiwan following an earthquake. The ramifications on the global economy is something we've tried to debate and think about. TSMC is actually up 1.4 percent. Analysts coming out and saying that the impact of TSMC operations from this earthquake should be manageable, according to Citigroup. Spotify up 5.7 percent. We're going to dig into why. That's on a price point change that they're currently offering. But let's look at Disney. 
down a quarter of a percent. We are all anticipating that important shareholder meeting. The proxy battle that has been going on for months, the deluge of ads that we've been served to get out there and vote if you're a retail investor. And, well, Pelts versus Iger. We'll win, Ed. Let's get more on the mouse house with the take from the in-house. Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Geeta Ranganathan. And, and Geeta, you did two interesting pieces of research earlier in the week published on the Bloomberg Terminal that with Disney pulling ahead, seems like that's still the case. Look at cash flow and look at fundamentals. Why was that your thesis? Yeah, thank you so much, Ed. So I think, you know, uh, what Pels has kind of been agitating for, Disney has more than delivered, right? So Disney has, uh, I mean, Pels has been speaking and kind of constantly his rallying cry has been on the poor stock price performance, on, you know, poor financial performance. And, and Bob Iger, what he's done ever since he's come back is he's really taken control of the narrative here. And he has instituted some really broad reforms across the company. Of course, the most critical being the cost cuts. And we've seen cost cuts across the board. We've seen their content budget kind of slash pretty dramatically. And what that's doing is it's improving earnings power at the company and it's improving free cash flow. And so we're going to see a 70% surge in Disney's free cash flow. We're almost back to pre-pandemic levels. Remember, before they went into streaming, they were generating about $10 billion in cash flow. Of course, that went down pretty dramatically through COVID, through the Fox acquisition, with the streaming launch. Uh, we were down to close to about $5 billion in, in 2023, but we're going to be up to $8 billion, more than $8 billion actually mm -hmm. in 2024 and probably even $10 billion next year. If Nelson Peltz, if Jay Rasulo, who was the previous CFO, don't get board seats, maybe they've ended up winning anyhow. If they've pushed, ultimately, these focus on costs, this focus on profitability to go hand in hand. How much do you think the fact that Vanguard and BlackRock have come out in support of Bob Iger, do you think that ultimately they're saying that you've got to stand by this, you've now got to enact some of these changes we need to see? Yeah, I think Disney definitely obviously has the edge, Caroline, as you just kind of pointed out, as they kind of go into this home home stretch of this meeting. But I think to to a great extent, I think Pels has also been a clear winner. I mean, the stock price, ever since he started agitating in October of last year, the stock price is up 45%. And I think it's definitely added, you know, obviously Iger has constantly complained that having all these activists, investors kind of breathing down his neck has been a constant distraction for him. And to some extent, I think that's... Uh, that's justified. Uh, but I think at the same time, kind of having them, you know, light a fire there was, was kind of important for him to really uh, accelerate kind of the change, right? So we've had him do some pretty transformative stuff, whether it's, you know, charting out ESPN's digital future, whether it's kind of putting Disney on financial, on, on, on firm financial footing, or whether it's the $60 billion investment in parks. So I, I think to a great extent, Pels has also won, even if he doesn't win the actual vote. Ether, it's always great to get your perspective. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst will be there viewing, I'm sure, later today. Geetha Ranganathan, we thank you. Now, and even more news coming out of the entertainment industry. Spotify, well, it's going to be raising the price of its streaming service in several key markets for not once but the second time in this year. And it's a step, of course, to keep on moving towards long-term profitability. Joining us for more, Bloomberg's Felix Gillette and a whole host of news happening in entertainment right now. Spotify, $1 to $2. Mm -hmm. how, how big a perspective is this that they're now going to have to start charging for audiobooks, it feels like. Well, I think it's a big move because for so long, Spotify kept the price the same, right? And now they've risen, the, you know, the rising prices twice within a year. Um, and I think that, you know, part of this is the introduction of audiobooks this last fall. Um, you got 15 hours with your premium plan, and you only paid if you went above those 15 hours. So Spotify's been paying these book publishers but mm -hmm. not collecting money. So now basically what's going to happen is if you want to keep listening to those audiobooks, you're going to pay a dollar or two dollars more a month, um, depending on your plan. Right. Uh, but they're also going to introduce a basic plan with just music and podcasts. And if you don't, but that that's important, right? The shares yeah. are up six percent ish, yeah. big on track for the biggest jump since the first week of December. So there's the thing the investors like, yeah, uh, which Caro outlined is moving towards profitability. But the consumer is going to look at it and go, oh, what? It's not another thing I've got to pay more for. Yeah. What are they getting in return? You know, what is the, the, the access that comes with it? Well, they're not getting much because they've already had free audiobooks. Right. You know, so basically they're getting the choice. Do you want to pay for audiobooks or do you just want to just listen to music and podcasts? So it's a little bit more choice. You Let's say. stay in the world of entertainment mm -hmm. and those that represent those that have big podcasts yeah. and big music. Endeavor. 
I mean, we've long heard from Ari Emanuel sitting down with our own Lucas Shaw at events mm. that we have, of course, like Screen Time. He didn't like being a public company ultimately or where his share price was, and right. now they're going back private. Yeah, there was always this frustration on Ari's part that, you know, the market wasn't valuing these collection of assets the same way they saw them, but it was always a little bit of a confusing mix, right? It was talent agencies, it was uh, open bet, you know, sports betting information, um, bull riding, uh, you know, the, the spinning off of UFC and merging with WWE. And what, what did it all add up to? I think this will give, uh, you know, the company more flexibility to make sense of those assets maybe sell off some of the um, pieces there um, without quite as much scrutiny from investors who didn't really get the vision. The shares actually moved on this, but I think we kind of knew it would be done. Yeah. There's an interesting paragraph in the story, which is, including the TKO element, Silver Lake gave this a $25 billion enterprise value, making it the largest private equity takeover of a public company in more than a decade. Why, why do we care about this maneuvering? Uh, I think it will be interesting. It, it gives, I mean, a, a little less visibility to what's happening in Hollywood from my perspective. Interesting. I mean, you could see WME, um, you know, you could see their, what was happening with the streaming with Peak TV as their revenues grew. We're going to get a little bit less visibility into that. Um, you know, we'll still be able to see what's happening with UFC and WWE. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see RA. I think it'll give him more flexibility to make some moves. Um, and he's been a big player in Hollywood. So I think that'll be fun to watch. Bloomberg's Felix Gillette. Your world's very busy at the moment. Entertainment, media, a lot of fun. Now coming up on the show, we're going to be joined by Brim Financial CEO Rasha Katabi on the company's brand new Series C round. Big numbers. That conversation is coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, today, fintech company Brim Financial announced an $85 million Series C funding round on the back of strong revenue growth. The company provides credit platform programs as a service to banks and large enterprises and says it's rapidly increasing its market share. Let's break it all down with Brim Financial CEO, Russia Katabi. Russia, good morning to you from New York City. Uh, what are you going to use the money for? We're going to be focusing on our expansion and the robustness of our credit card platforms. Um, and we're really excited about this race. Thank you for having me on, Ed. Russia, interesting, of course, you're building the business in Canada. You're looking at penetration here in the United States. And you say that you're going to be redefining the credit card and payment infrastructure landscape. For those not steeped in the world of fintech, what does that look like? Well, you know, we're seeing a lot of changes in the market, uh, you know, Caroline, with just the capping of the fees that, you know, was just announced in the U.S., which we think actually is really positive all around. But it's going to have an undeniable impact on credit card issuers, and it's going to highlight the importance of the product construct, the strength of the platform capabilities, and that is what's going to drive, we feel, positioning and competitive landscape, as opposed to leaning in too much in interchange revenue the way, you know, value propositions used to, you know, be front and center. So you're kind of helping financial companies make their mark, stand out, offer things. But it's notable, you say MasterCard Visa had capped ultimately some of their fees, but they're also getting fees in other ways. There's another great story coming from our own page, a reporter here, saying that MasterCard actually plans to increase certain credit card fees beginning April 15th, and these are going to be more network assessment fees. So do these credit card companies end up making money no matter what? Well, you know, when you hold the keys to the castle, uh, you always have a way to protect your share of revenues. I think undeniably, MasterCard and Visa are great companies that play a key role in the ecosystem. And uh, undoubtedly, I don't think this is going to impact their revenues or their stock price, Caroline. Russia, today's Tech Daily newsletter is a look at the funding environment for startups. And what our colleague Priya Anand outlines is it's been a pretty rough start to the year. And if you're not an AI company, you're not allowed, or you're not allowed, but you're not going to be able to raise funds. That's the kind of thesis outlined in the Tech Daily. But you did raise funds, and you're not an AI company on the face of it. 
How difficult was it and, and how did you go about it? Mm. Um, yes, As, you know, certainly it's a, it's a significantly harder environment, a more challenged environment than a few years ago, let's say. So the entire process of raising funds is much more rigorous. You know, luckily for us at BRIM, we've TEDxed our revenues since the Series B, and we've expanded our product and platform capabilities significantly in both the credit card and payment space. We've also signed on some really awesome partnerships that are key in fueling the, the global expansion. You know, I refer you to the MasterCard partnership that we announced in December 2023, where MasterCard in the U.S. selected BRIM to be their credit card platform as a service strategic partner, really to help their own customers be competitive, offer innovative product and payment solutions, and better serve their own customers, be whether they be consumers, small businesses, or large companies. There's one word I don't think I heard you use yet, which is profit. Did your investors in this Series C up round want to see some profit? Yeah, thank you for it. It was a very robust up round for Brim since our Series B. And I think it's simply a testament to what we've been doing uh, for the past three years. The, the, the massive growth, the, you know, very much the market is reacting to that and we're thrilled about it on AI, and you said on the face of it, we're not an AI company, of course. However, AI undeniably is being rolled out across the BRIM platforms. And that together, combining it with open banking capabilities that we're rolling out, is going to enable our clients to unlock key new opportunities. So interesting, your background, two decades in the capital markets, you're at TD Bank, you're at Merrill. You've then seen this problem, gone out and fixed it. Now you're looking to the US. Is it talent that you need? Is it marketing spend that you need to hit the B2B audience? Where do you deploy the money raised? Yeah, that's that's awesome. Much. We're definitely focusing on the hiring already. Caroline, our company is half U.S., half Canada, more or less, from a staffing perspective. We're going to be definitely increasing our footprint as well as uh, you know folks that are going to be joining Brim that are all U.S. based. Uh, currently, we have our CEO in Miami, our CFO is in the Bay Area, and definitely that I think that that trend continues. Mm. A truly sort of decentralized business at the moment. Brim Financial CEO Rasha Katabi, really great to have some time with you today. Thank you. Coming up, we're going to be joined by ThreadUp CEO James Reinhardt. We're we'll discussing the company's latest findings on resale industry trends and guess what? A sprinkling of AI too, Ed. Uh, Caroline, I'm, I'm going to continue keeping an eye on what's happened in Taiwan. You know, the worst seismic event, earthquake in, in 25 years. Sadly, nine were killed. But these are the US listed shares or ADRs of TSMC, the biggest contract chip manufacturer in the world. They're near session highs, one and a half percent. If you look at the sell side reaction, there's, everyone's pretty sanguine that this is not going to have a big impact. City calling the situation on those key chip plants in Taiwan manageable. But we'll continue to track the latest that is coming out of Taiwan. This is Bloomberg Technology. the resale market of your apparel because it's a booming industry. The second-hand apparel market is in fact growing 11% annually on average in the United States. It's all according to ThreadUp's latest report. And that market is even slated to reach $73 billion by 2028. Let's get the person behind this report, ThreadUp CEO James Reinhardt, joining us for more. And we've seen many ways people wanting, whether it's environmental reasons, whether it's financial reasons, to, to basically be more thrifty, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that, that is certainly the trend these days. People are looking for value uh, and they're looking to be unique. And I think that's where resale uh, really hits the bid. What I find so interesting about this, James, is the marketplace. Um, technology must be involved to assign a value to any specific garment as, as much as the participation of the seller and the buyer, right? Just to explain the process to us. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, thrifting secondhand has been around a long time, right? eBay, Craigslist, you know, really invented this market, you know, over 30 years ago. I think what's changed over the last 10 years is companies like ThreadUp that have come onto the scene and really brought technology to the forefront. So we run four distribution centers around the country where consumers send us their goods that they're no longer wearing. We process all of those goods. 
Uh, we process more than 100,000 unique items every day, nearly 60,000 brands in our system. We process those items, we put them online for resale, and then we allow buyers to shop like they're shopping on Amazon or Nordstrom. And so we've really built a consumer experience that I think meets, meets the consumer where they are and, and really uh, is technology driven. Demographics, James. I mean, I've come to thread up for children's clothes because ultimately yeah, I think sure. that's a real, yeah, they're getting through them really quickly and you want to be ensuring that you're being environmentally friendly and a little bit thrifty on it. But who is generally your buyer right now? I think what's so remarkable about the resale industry is, I mean, your experience is a classic one. You know, uh, our original tagline in our business was, uh, clothes don't grow, kids do. <laughs> uh, but what, what you're finding is whether it's Gen Z or millennials, uh, Gen X, boomers, everybody is starting to approach thrift uh, in a more mainstream way because the value certainly is something that the consumer cares about today. And one of the things that thrift provides for, for folks, no matter your age, is the ability to find something that's unique, right? It's not on the store at your, at your favorite high street store. It might be from a few years ago. And I think that combination of uniqueness uh, on top of value is something that transcends generations. I mean, just, as, just because we get older doesn't mean we don't want to find great deals and want to be our, a unique expression of ourselves. And I think that's what's driving it. You've kind of led us to competition. You know, you mentioned the history of thrift, particularly the digital marketplace. You know, Craigslist, when I moved to the United States, was kind of my first introduction to that. Who is now your biggest competition? And, and do they have the sophistication of live data marketplace that you do? Yeah, I think where the industry has evolved, you know, five, six, seven years ago, you would, you would sit in a room with a number of people and they would say, oh, I use ThreadUp or I use the Real Real or, or one of the other peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. And I think what's fascinating now is that you're in a conversation with you know, half a dozen people and every single person is using uh, one of the thrift uh, companies. And so I think it's a rising tide lifts all boats. I think generally speaking, thrift and resale as a category is taking share you know, from mainstream high street uh, apparel brands. And I think the data shows that consumers are, are thrifting more and more each year. I mean, the, th the resale market's growing three times as fast uh, as the traditional retail market. So uh, we personally worry a little less about uh, the competition and, uh, and ultimately about the size of the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that the, the, the opportunity is large and you know, we'll take our chances on the field. So when it comes to basically preaching to the non-converted, it's got to be influencers, right? How are you marketing at the moment in a digitally savvy manner? Yeah, I mean, we, we, do, we work with a lot of influencers. We certainly are in the ad markets. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, direct mail. Uh, we do TV. And, and I think, generally speaking, the, the fastest way that the resale business has grown uh, is through word of mouth and, and through you know, tastemakers and influencers talking about this, the destigmatization uh, of secondhand. And I think 10 years ago, it wasn't cool, necessarily, to shop secondhand. And I think ThreadUp deserves a lot of credit. We deserve a lot of credit for creating momentum in an industry where now it's actually one of the coolest things to do. You talk right. to young people, you talk to celebrities, it's vintage, it's unique, it's resale. Uh, and so I think all the stigma has gone away and I think that's really what's gonna drive momentum in the category over the next 10 years. ThreadUp CEO James Reinhart, great to have you talk us through the industry and the way in which you're navigating it. Thank you very much indeed. Meanwhile, I mean, we've got to go back to what is going to be a big event this for all those one. technology yep. investors and media investors coming up later in the show. It's the Disney share. Yeah, like Disney shares softer six tenths of a percent. We're probably still even treading water at that level. The latest reporting is that Bob Iger has the support of the big institutionals, BlackRock, Vanguard. The wild card or the unknown is the retail group, you know, yeah. that traditionally might go with an activist. Um, but tune in because we're going to be on it all day long. And I think ultimately retail investors tend to go with the board that's in place and certainly if you've been a retail investor you've been bombarded with a whole number of ads asking you to do right. just that but as we were just discussing with Geetha ultimately maybe trans kind of won here final thing it's so weird but 1 p.m pacific 4 p.m eastern there's a webcast i wonder if like it's the most watched agm of all time uh we'll find out well, oracle yeah. of omaha might have something to say about that that does it for this edition of bloomberg technology check out the pod you know exactly where to find it apple spotify iheart and on bloomberg this is bloomberg technology